So uh, now I think it's also time for the official opening remarks. So let me introduce Dr. Salvara Jeramasami, who is the head of uh, Agriculture Extension and Research uh, Unit at FAO. And uh, he's uh, leading FAO's uh, efforts and activities on strengthening agriculture innovation system, as well as improving agriculture extension and advisory services, um, as well as knowledge sharing and outreach activities related to innovative agriculture technologies and practices. Uh, he's also the, um, working on strengthening partnership of FAO and research and extension um, international fora. And he has more than 25 years experience in applied agriculture research, education and extension. We'll also hear from Dr. Rashid Suleiman. Uh, he's the director of Center for Research of Innovation and Science Policy, CRISP at Hyderabad, India. He has a doctorate in agriculture extension and he has more than uh, 25 years. Sorry, I'm just putting to the next poll. He has also more than uh, 25 years um, of experience in the area of agriculture extension and application of innovation system framework in agriculture. He was also a science, um, senior scientist uh, with the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. And um, he's um, a member of the board of the Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services. And he's coordinating uh, agriculture extension in South Asia Network. So now, while you are still voting to tell us uh, to what stakeholder group uh, you belong to, you can already see many responses. And uh, I would like, uh, while you are voting, I would like to give a floor to Selva Rajan for his opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic is a global crisis which is affecting the food and agricultural sector. Protecting lives, ensuring sufficient food supplies, and the functioning of essential services are critical. We need to mitigate the risk of large-scale impacts, especially on the poor and most vulnerable. Of course, there are many options available to address this issue. Some of them are boosting social protection programs, promoting measures to keep the food supply chains, and support farmers to increase their production. These are some of the options to reduce the impacts. Agricultural extension and advisory services play a critical role at the front line of response in realizing these options. However, to adapt to this crisis response, within the specific government regulations, EAS need to rapidly change their way of operating. EAS can make critical contribution in four main action areas. Number one, assessing the field situation and advocating for urgent response from the government. Two, ensuring the adequate support that adequate support is given to protect, uh, protect production activities. Three, providing trusted source and contact details to ensure easy access to inputs, markets, and credit. And four, ensuring access to storage facilities and overcome market disruptions. However, the EAS providers extension and advisory service providers are constrained by restricted mobility during this pandemic. Thus, use of remote communication and digital tools is the reality. Therefore, EAS systems need to quickly adapt and innovate to ensure an effective response. In this context, FAO, together with Regional Network of Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services, organizes this particular webinar to discuss the role of EAS in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. Coming to the specific objectives of this webinar, there are three. Number one is to explore and discuss the potential roles of EAS actors in providing essential services. Number two, to share experiences of key measures that the EAS actors are undertaking by adopting their capacity and operational mechanisms. Number three is to highlight specific country examples from 
three countries in this case, China, India, and Lao PDR, and their response to overcome challenges of COVID-19 impact. With this brief introductory remarks, I welcome all participants and presenters to this important webinar and seek your active participation. I thank you for your kind attention. Many thanks, Elvarajo. And now you would like to hear also from Rashid. Hey, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, let me join Dr. Selvaraju in welcoming you all to this seminar, this webinar. I represent the Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services as one of its board members. And I believe most of you know GFRAS and its uh, main three regional networks in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And GFRAS is basically is one of them is providing a kind of a platform for ES extension advisory services stakeholders to strengthen their contribution to agricultural, agriculture and rural development. In Asia, we are basically, uh, and we are organized, the regional network is organized under the Asia Pacific Islands Rural Advisory Services, and it's composed of sub-regional networks in South Asia, Southeast Asia, Mekong, Pacific, and Central Asia, and the Caucasus. As we all know, as Dr. Salveraju has all the major role in supporting farmers to deal with the uh, challenges from COVID-19. And this has been very well articulated in the recent FAO policy brief on this theme in terms of mobilizing extension advisory services to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. And for GFRAS also strengthening the contribution of EAS to address COVID-19 challenges is an important priority. Both GFRAS, APIRAS and the ESA all the networks have initiated special pages on their website, mainly to share experiences from different countries on how they are basically addressing these uh, challenges. And I would urge all of you to have a look at some of these web pages on COVID-19 and the EAS extension advisory services in these web pages, and also to share your contributions, your maybe your experiences you know, from the regions and countries where you belong to. Before I conclude, I would like to thank the FAO, the Research and Extension Unit of FAO, for taking a lead in organizing this webinar in collaboration with the GIFRA sub-regional networks. And I also look forward to an interesting webinar. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Rashid, um, and Selva Raju for opening remarks. And now just let us see who, um, with the results of the poll. So as you could, we could see, we had a quite, um, a differentiated geographical presence. And uh, in terms of the stakeholders, we have uh, definitely many representatives from international development organizations and donors, but also quite many from research in academia, NGOs and civil society organizations, public and government, also business, so, okay, let me now close the poll. And I would like to introduce uh, the first presentation on the impact of COVID-19 on food and agriculture sector in Asia. Uh, we will hear from Mr. Sridhar Dharmapori, who is senior, uh, senior food safety and nutrition officer and group leader of um, agriculture and food systems team in FAO regional office um, for the Asia Pacific in Bangkok. He's coordinated a dedica dedicated technical task force to deliver the regional response to the impact of COVID-19 on food and agriculture, which includes country level assessments, sorry, uh, the provision of immediate policy and technical advice and the development of linked uh, projects and programs. His technical expertise covers implementing the sustainable resilient food systems approach, strengthening core elements of national food uh, control system, systems and enhancing trade through safe value chains. So uh, Sridhar, over to you. Thank you, Sophia. And good morning and good afternoon to everybody who is on this call. First, let me thank AGDR for starting to organize this series of webinars and especially choosing to start with Asia first. So my job here today would just be to set the scene uh, to tell you about some of the issues that are 
emerging in Asia as well as the Pacific because our office covers both the regions. And then we look forward to hearing from all the, the expert speakers on, what, on suggestions and solutions that we could actually implement in course of our work as countries start to get into, go past the immediate response to COVID-19 and then go into the recovery phase. So just to give you a brief overview, um, what we are doing uh, from, the, from the regional office in Bangkok is to support all our member countries and all the member countries, including in the specific sub-region, uh, which is about a total of 45, to uh, carry out country level assessments of the impact of COVID-19 on food security, agriculture, and livelihoods. This effort is being led by our 17 country offices and the Pacific sub-regional office. Uh, it's been carried out in two parts. One is to actually look at food security and nutrition and agriculture. So issues that are within FAO's mandate in one way. And the second in partnership with the UN country team who are obviously also concerned about the larger socioeconomic aspects and impacts because this, this pandemic is one which has touched almost everyone. Uh, we are, the, there's a strong task force at RAP made of economists, subject matter specialists, people who work across the food system, natural resources, as well as on various aspects of policy and who are supporting the countries to carry out these assessments. And the key themes under which we carry them out are underlined here. And you can see here that a lot of them are the ones that we are all mostly concerned about. Supply chains on labor and labor and migration, phone demand disruptions, and especially the socioeconomic impact. The other issues such as food processing, food safety are relatively not big. Uh, food safety is, it's a very um, strange thing that it's COVID-19 is not a food safety problem at all, but there is a lot of discussion around. And of course, let's not forget when we talk about the impact on the smallholders, farmers, fishers, all the participants in the supply chain who are actually bearing the brunt of the impact of this pandemic. So I will just give you a few uh, takeaways that we've had so far from this, uh, from these assessments, because I have only a very short time to cover all this. The first thing is that largely the supply chains and value chains have remained functional there have been intermittent malfunctions. It's important to state here there is adequate or probably more than adequate supplies of food. However, the restrictions of movement on lockdowns on trade and travel have actually impacted some of these issues. And that's why we see certain impacts, for instance, on the transport of perishables. This has been um, an issue which a lot of countries had had to be advised on how to get their agriculture retransport started. And this is something for the, um, the extension officers to actually consider that how do we actually now keep uh, moving these supply chains from farmer to market, as well as ensuring the supply of inputs to the farmer, because all this requires transport and it requires people to move it around. So this could be an important place where the, uh, the extension officers could actually react on find uh, ways to do this in a smart way, possibly using all the innovative digital solutions uh, that are there. The second is on labor shortages and surpluses. So what are the ways are we going to handle this? There has been large scale movement of migrants from let's say the urban areas back to the rural areas from one country to the other. So for instance, from Thailand to Laos and vice versa. So there are shortages in some places of labor and there are surpluses. So how do we go about, how do we go about uh, finding solutions to ensure that labor is gainfully employed where they are. Uh, what about say, solutions such as direct seeded rice? Would that be useful? That's just one suggestion. It doesn't have to be the only one. Uh, I'm sure all of you have uh, many other things to suggest. So these are issues that we probably might need to consider when we look at the impact um, on uh, agriculture and how extension could actually help. In terms of food prices, they are largely stable. And if you look at this link that I've put here, which is on the FAO website, you'll actually see that across Asia, the nominal rise in domestic prices is a maximum of 5%. It's actually lower in most countries, uh, except in one for uh, Myanmar, where it's almost up to 25%. But most of the other countries are not actually suffering from major food price fluctuations. 
And it's also because there are no major export restrictions. The last big one was won by Vietnam, and that was removed about a few weeks ago. And therefore, that situation has normalized too. And international markets are calm as well. But the big problem is are the declining incomes and the job manufacturing, fishing, livestock, agriculture in general, there will be a reduction in demand uh, for, um, for most products is widespread. So that will happen. Whether agriculture will be a suitable buffer, as it happened last time when we had the Southeast Asian crisis about 23 years ago, would that happen again? Is, is a maybe, it's also unlikely. The agriculture sector is no more as big as it was then. For instance, in, uh, for example, in, in India, the, uh, the agricultural sector contributed up to 60% of national income about 20 or 30 years ago. Now it's down to less than 30%. So the area for operation there is very less. Therefore, the social protection schemes, which most of the countries in the region have actually rolled out, actually now become even more important. So they might need to be sustained over a longer time and not be seen simply as relief. They might have to be seen as important for recovery. The last uh, takeaway is that some countries continue to be vulnerable. These are food crisis countries. So Afghanistan has been in this situation for a while. Parts of Pakistan, parts of Bangladesh, especially on uh, the border with Myanmar, where we have more than a million refugees in Cocktail Bazaar. Some parts of Papua New Guinea, for instance, they all are likely food crisis or are or are likely to be food crisis zones. And that is that vulnerability needs to be taken into consideration when all policies are rolled out. There's also heavy import dependence, particularly in the Pacific. Many of them actually import most of their food and they have faced a sustained period of, um, of issues related to import. First, for, before the COVID, there was the measles outbreak and now you have the COVID and therefore they continue to, and there's a loss of tourism, which could well continue into next year. And that is going to actually compound the issue. There are other compounding factors. As we speak, there's a cyclone heading to the coast of eastern India and Bangladesh. There are other cyclones which have hit, notably Harold in the Pacific. And there are continuing problems with transboundary pests and diseases. The locusts in Southwest Asia, the fall army worm, which has spread all across Asia and is heading into the Pacific, and the African swine fever, which also has now spread all across Asia, as you can see in the map, and is heading to the Pacific. So these all add to the vulnerability, and this is where we need to come um, with the kind of um, measures that can actually contribute to mitigating them. So our recommendations and what we have been doing so far is to um, roll out emergency support and uh, also uh, support for social protection schemes, which many countries are rolling out on their own and therefore providing policy advice. Um, it will be important, again, for the extension to consider how to implement physical distancing in food supply chains because that will be important to keep them moving and physical distancing is here to stay. It won't go away. It, it's, it's very much now in our long-term plan. And uh, collaborating between the private and public sector to solve supply chain disruption. So instance, if we need to solve some transport problem, how do we, what's the quickest way around it rather than waiting for some decisions to be taken at a high level. In terms of recovery, we're supporting projects on local food production, including for urban areas. So here's again um, an area for extension to be very active in how to encourage local food production and make it sustainable too and not just uh, transport, spe uh, transport species and varieties from other areas. Uh, what are the innovations that we can roll out to support the rural economy and livelihoods? So those, are so those are the kind of projects that we already put in place. And then in the long term, to look at policies and institutions for sustainable and resilient food systems. So examples of these, so of the last one, are, for example, in Bangladesh and Indonesia, where uh, the government itself has realized that the current food system has actually been shown up. The weaknesses have been shown up by the COVID-19, and these need to be addressed. And these will then also lead to other positive effects or roll-on effects onto food security and nutrition. So that essentially is um, what we are actually doing in this region. I'd just like to conclude with um, just to show you uh, some of the fantastic work has been done by our communications team in the region who have put out a series of simple messages, both on social issues, on food security and nutrition, on food safety, on a variety of issues. 
which have been very well taken up by the local press and reported extensively. They've all been translated into local languages. And apart from putting out the messaging on the key actions, both in terms of health measures, how to safeguard supply chains, how to keep them moving, how to ensure that markets are open. There are also, the other thing that it does is to fight fake news. And I would just leave you all, and especially all of you, those who are watching from across the world, that to keep a very close eye on this, don't believe fake news. Make sure you get your news from reliable sources, such as the FAO, the WHO, other agencies who are working, and make sure that we do not make this problem worse by actually um, by believing any of the fake news that circulates around. So FAO has a very good web, detailed web page with all the resources. I urge you all to consult it regularly. And then we are also, you can, you know where to find us in Bangkok. You can always write to us for any other information or advice that you need. So I will stop here and I'll just thank once again AGDR for giving us the opportunity to be present here. Thank you and over to you, Sophie. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, very interesting presentation. I think it really set the scene for this webinar which focuses on Asia. So it is very uh, good to know what is the situation uh, on the continent. And um, I would very like uh, to echo one of the last, let's say, messages that you mentioned regarding the fake news. I think it is uh, a huge issue also considering how little we are still we are still getting to know uh, the pandemic in all its uh, you know impacts so fake uh, news are really a big um, a big issue so uh, now i would like to introduce our next presentation uh, on extension advisory services at frontline of covid-19 re response ensuring food security what challenges and adaptations uh, are needed um, this presentation will be given by our colleague, Der Germa Chumun Batar, who is Agriculture Extension Officer in FAO. She has over 20 years of experience working in agriculture and rural development and a PhD in interdisciplinary studies, including adult education, extension and rural development. Now in FAO, uh, her work includes uh, institutional reforms, extension policies and performance metrics, institutionalization of good extension practices, facilitation of innovation processes, capacity development for strengthening agriculture, uh, national agriculture extension and innovation systems. So, uh, Dagi, over to you. We'll be talking about extension and advisory services and its contribution to COVID-19 response during and post pandemic. The global impact of COVID-19 is expanding daily and its full impact is not yet known. COVID-19 is not only a health issue, its impact on economies and food system is unprecedented. It is predicted that this, this pandemic may increase world's poor and food insecure significantly. It's affecting countries, regions, as well as commodities across the globe quite differently. People who are hit hardest are poorest and most vulnerable, which include smallholder producers in rural areas. For now, there is no shock in terms of food availability, but we cannot make assumption that everyone has equal access to food. Food supply chain is a complex web of interactions and of actors. The struggles along the supply chain are mostly in terms of logistics, that's movement of food, access to market, distribution of agriculture inputs, as well as shortage of labor to produce and process food. The chain effect of pandemic has left agriculture and food sector extremely vulnerable and put rural producers under high pressure to produce food for 2021. If food production is reduced this year, what will food availability look like in 2021? Now, why do we need to talk about extension advisory services and what can they do? Extension advisory resource system includes a network of actors that are already present in the communities. They can be public, private, producer organizations, community-based groups, NGOs, informal women's groups, etc. As a long-term trusted partners of producers and local communities, a network of extension advisory service providers are uniquely positioned to assess the situation in the field 
provide tailored services and informal governments during and post pandemic. But it's not always automatic. Extension and advisory services need to make some adjustments and adaptation according to the emerging condition and local circumstances. So during pandemic, the role of extension advisory service is even more critical than ever before to support rural producers overcoming new and unfamiliar challenges. Here are a few of many critical roles extension and advisory services can play. That includes to raise awareness through timely and accurate information from and to field, and to contribute to real-time assessment of the situation in the field to allow rapid response, to support producers with the production, logistics, inputs, and market linkages to promotion of value chain, informal markets, homegrown food, virtual matchmaking of demand and supply for food, labor, and inputs, as well as organizing group marketing and delivery. Lastly, extension advisory services also can assist mediating conflicts and social tensions. While health emergencies and prevention measures may be relaxed over time, the socioeconomic crisis, including poverty and food insecurity, may become even more severe. Tremendous effort and resources will be needed to recover from the impact of COVID-19. In this regard, extension and advisory services can play an instrumental role in, to help increase resilience and build livelihoods of rural people and communities. Recovery of COVID-19 impact requires establishment of better coordinated network of actors that can provide a wide range of services in an efficient and effective way, facilitation of linkages, with other mechanisms such as social protection and insurance schemes, promotion of locally available, nutritious and high value produce, empowerment of rural people, including youth and women through strengthened technical and functional skills to better manage farming as a business, also to strengthen partnership with private sector to ensure efficient functioning of food supply chain as a brokerage between producers and agribusinesses. So most importantly, the COVID-19 pandemic is forcing us to reflect on the way we do business and providing opportunities to innovate. In order to play this indispensable role, extension advisory service providers also need to adapt and rapidly innovate. There are many innovations and creative solutions being put forward to deal with issues we are facing today. Some of the changes and trends we are observing since January includes going local, local solutions for local problems. Impact of COVID-19 is not uniform. Within the same country, people and communities are affected differently. Promotion of local food, market, local Labor banks are instrumental in strengthening local capacity and building resilient communities. Going digital, this is where a lot of innovations coming up. Digital tools and technologies can be very complementary to face-to-face -to -face extension and advisory, service, advisory services. In context of COVID-19, digital tools enable information flow in spite of physical distancing and mobility constraints. However, Access to digital services is not always automatic by all. Engaging with existing formal and informal networks will be essential to increase efficiency and expand outcome of the services. Also to support rural producers effectively, it is clear that extension and advisory service providers need to develop new sets of skills and strengthen their capacities both technically and functionally. Ultimately, we do, we do believe that it is an opportunity to assess current extension advisory service system very carefully and invest in structural transformation and reform of the system that builds better human capital and resilient agri-food system. 
with that, I'd like to thank you all and uh, to, to look for more information on what I presented. I uh, like you to go to FAO website and search for policy briefs on extension and advisory services in the context of COVID and you will see um, Okay, I think um, that this is the end of the presentation. Thank you, Dagi, so much uh, for your uh, presentation. I think it's a very good overview of, it even starts to, to show how many actually things there are that extension advisory services uh, could do, but it clearly requires a lot of also <sighs> adaptation from within the system. Uh, so now uh, we will uh, start to hear from our colleagues um, in different uh, countries in Asia, as Salvarajo mentioned before, from China, India and Laos. Uh, we'll hear about uh, different experiences in those countries. Uh, however, uh, we think that everyone in this meeting has something interesting to share. And uh, we would like to introduce um, a couple of questions that uh, it would be great if you could elaborate a little bit um, reply in the chat. So, um, okay. I will type these questions in the chat. And I will also share them on the screen. Just a second. Okay, I hope you can see them now on the screen. So, COVID-19 posed an unprecedented challenge to extension advisory services and the way they operate, focus us, fo forcing us all to rethink the EIS functions, partnerships, governance, and capacities to adapt rapidly. Based on your experience and to capitalize on lessons learned, what should EIS start doing from now on that have not done, that have not been done before? What should AIS stop doing? Maybe there are some, let's say, functions and let's say services which were provided which are not really relevant anymore or not the most important ones in this new situation. And what should EIS continue to do and do more? So please, while we are hearing from our speakers, you can also give some thoughts to it and reply to these questions in the chat. Um, you can see these questions also in the chat, and then we will remind you of those questions uh, during the course of the presentations. Okay. So <clears throat> now I would like to uh, introduce the first speaker from uh, China, Ms. Nanbei. He's the director of Department of Public Affairs in the Pinduadua. I hope I pronounced it. Uh, not too bad. And this is an e-commerce platform in uh, <clears throat> China. It's the second largest e-commerce platform actually, uh, based on the users and order numbers. PDD, which is a short uh, name, provides local government and farmers with insights on consumer preferences and market pricing, pricing to help them better market and tailor their products. PDD works also with local governments and agronomies through uh, the web web farms to raise productivity and build sustainable models. And with its existing network and infrastructure, PDD could quickly roll out measures in response to COVID-19 to help farmers sell their produce rapidly at better prices while providing much needed resources such as training and farming supplies. One important uh, note on this presentation, while well, Ms. Nanbei, she is very happy, of course, to answer your questions. Um, but uh, she will leave her email, uh, we'll leave it in the chat, and she will collect your uh, possible questions and comments and reply by email. Okay, so thank you so much to Ms. Nanbai, and I think we can start the presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Nan, I'm from Pindodo. Today I wanna to share a story that how we helped millions of farmers mitigate damages by COVID-19 in China. 
This place is Pingli, a small county in Shanxi province. As one of the oldest towns in China, Pingli has a history of over 2,000 years and population of over 230,000. Pingli is located in the middle of Qingyi Mountains, which is the boundary of south and north of China. Surrounded by mountains and mountains, it takes almost five hours to drive to the capital of Shanxi province, Xi'an. Pingli has just got off the poverty in this February. The natural resources bring Pingli abundant agricultural products, but the traditional sales system is very hard to sell good agricultural products out of the mountains. And what's more, the COVID-19 caused the shutting down of wholesale market, which are the key point of traditional cell system. This girl, Wang Xiumei, together with 51 farmers in Pingli, used a new method, e-commerce platform, to sell Genostema pentaphila, a kind of tea with high nutritional value. This new method helped her cooperative not only survive during the epidemic time, but also grows very quickly. Wang Xiumei quit her job as a teacher in cities in 2015 and went back to her hometown to set up a cooperative and launched Dodo Farm with startup capital of like uh, 520,000 RMB donated by Ping Dodo uh, in, uh, 19, in two, uh, 2019. And as of today, her online shop was, has not only ranked number one in the list of Pingdodo Healthy Herb Tea category, but also encouraged other farmers in Pingli County to open nearly like 1,000 shops in Pingdodo platform. Selling products through e-commerce platform help farmers in Pingli make more money than ever before and get, off, get out of poverty. Three weeks ago, President Xi went to Pingli and encouraged her face to face. E-commerce is a new type of business. You need to work hard. In recent years, tens of thousands of new farmers with e-commerce experience have returned to their hometown from cities. Relying on the new e-commerce platform represented by Pingdodo, agricultural products from like 12 million farmers across the country have been sold directly to the homes of 585 million users of PDD platform. The COVID-19 stopped the people from seeing each other, but it cannot stop the circulation of goods. Actually, the COVID-19 accelerates the development of e-commerce. Through e-commerce platform, consumer and producer are connected to each other very closely, which has never happened before. Since March 15th, more than 50 million packages are on their way to Pindodo's customers every day. In order to let consumers see the status of the agricultural products and even the production and the processing process from home, Starting from February 10th, Pinduoduo took the lead in live broadcast activities during the epidemic. Moreover, PDD invited the city and the county officials to sit, speak for the agricultural products in their hometown. In cooperation with Shandong, Zhejiang, Anhui, Guangdong, Guangxi, Jiangxi, Hubei, and other provinces, PDD connected nearly which are actually over 100 live broadcasts of caring for agricultural events in like three months. As of April 20th, PDD has sold more than 300 million kilograms of unsellable agricultural products, covering nearly 400 agricultural production area across the country, including more than 230 National poverty stricken countries, counties helped more than 180,000 business and farmers affected by the epidemic. In addition, PDD provided logistic subsidies and agro product subsidies, 
We also provided online training courses for farmers. In cooperation with the central and local government, we are making every effort to help farmers affected by the COVID-19. For agricultural products to get to cons consumers from farmers, it used to need like six to eight supply chain links. With the help of new e-commerce platform SPDB, now the process is reduced to only like two to three steps. Under the training of Dodo University and other institutions, people like Wang Xiumei picked up their mobile phones and returned to their hometown. They become a whole new generation of farmers. The story of Wang Xiumei is an epitome of this rapid changing world. As Colin Huang, the founder and CEO of Pindodo, citing his letter to shareholders, when this tiny virus was dropped into our world, it acted just like a catalyst in the test tube, accelerating the formation of a whole new world. New metals are bound to emerge and grow in a whole new setup. We are in need seeing the phasing out of something as new ones emerge. It is a time of re-establishment. That's what I want to share for today. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me through my email or WeChat. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And um, let's pass now to our second presentation from China. Um, <clears throat> Well, uh, this one was on the private uh, extension advisory services. Now, Ms. Uh, Zhang Mei, uh, who is a senior agronomist at Plant Protection sta uh, Station of Sichuan Provincial Department of Agriculture and Rural Affairs in China. Uh, she will tell us about public extension experience. Uh, the presentation is called uh, remote consultation and digital services to smallholder farmers on crop pest monitoring and control in case of COVID-19 pandemic in Sichuan province of China. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Yang Mei uh, has over 14 years uh, of experience in agriculture extension and has done a lot of research and application promoting green prevention and control of crop diseases and insect pests, integrated control, application of new pesticides and new drugs and devices. Uh, she participated also in the Chinese-German Agriculture Exchange Program for Youth Professional, visited thousands of farmers and exchange uh, experiences sustainable agriculture development, and uh, she has also experience in training farmer programs, for example, on the safe use of pesticides. So, uh, Ms. Uh, Mai, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank the Research and Extension Unit of FAO to give us this opportunity to share our experience on remote consultation and digital services on crop pest monitoring and control to smallholder farmers in case of COVID-19. Sichuan, located in southwest China, is a large agricultural province. Wheat strip rust is an important disease in danger wheat, poses a great impact on yield. During the Chinese Lunar New Year, it is an important period for the occurrence and prevalence of wheat strip rust. As usual, my colleagues and I strengthen monitoring and early warning on the eve of the Spring Festival, issue prevention and control warnings. After the Spring Festival holiday, our technicians immediately go to the countryside to check and control the disease. However, COVID-19 epidemic in this year has disrupted our normal work rhythm. In the early stage of the COVID-19 pandemic, we were unable to check the situation on the front line due to the lack of masks and limited traffic. However, the investigation and prevention of street rust was imminent. How to solve this problem? First, we established a one-to-one -one contact guidance system. We selected the experts from the Sichuan Plant Protection Export Committee, 
adopted the 121 one working method in which one provincial export contacts one city and established QQ group and WeChat group. If, upon receiving the online help from farmers, a grassroots technician cannot solve the problem, he can consult in time in the group and discuss with other members. Provincial experts conduct online disease identification, diagnosis, and provide technical guidance through videos and photos. In addition, we publish disease and pest information through multiple channels such as data collection and online consultation. In the county level plant protection department, since the collected pest survey data to the provincial station by mills and state database. Furthermore, we can collect photos of pests on the monitoring points through the Internet of Things monitoring equipment, so we can reduce the number of field investigations. We summarize the occurrence of plant diseases and insect pests in various places then organize experts to conduct online consultations through the mobile app, study the determine and trend of plant diseases and insect pests, publish the trend forecasts through mails, network, QQ group, and TV stations. Now, please watch a short video. Santai County, affiliated to Mianyang City, Sichuan Province, lies in the north of the central Sichuan Basin, covering an area of 2,659.38 square kilometers. It is a large agricultural county with a population of more than 1 million. The wheat is one of the main food crops in the county, with a planting area of 22,666 hectares. The wheat stripe rust is the main disease which severely reduces the yield. The Agricultural and Rural Bureau of Santai County conducted a pre-winter survey of wheat stripe rust from late November 2019 and identified the stripe rust in Tongchuan Town on December 11, 2019. With the outbreak of COVID-19 pneumonia, the Agricultural Department of Santai County can only learn about the outbreak of wheat stripe rust in the county by online means. In this February, Lin Hongmei, a large wheat grower, discovered a strict rust in the wheat. She contacted the technicians of the plant protection station via WeChat, and the technicians provided solutions through online remote diagnosis. <laughs> In addition, the leaders of Santai County held many expert video conferences to study the situation of wheat stripe rust prevention and instructed all towns and plant protection companies to carry out timely prevention and control. During the epidemic, Santai Media Center released methods for the prevention of wheat stripe rust through various platforms, such as websites, mobile phone, and television covering more than 500,000 people. More than 3,000 text messages had been sent to major wheat growers in the county via mobile phone, which raised the awareness of prevention and control in local wheat growers. Through effective work, the average yield of wheat in the county stood at about 4.5 tons per hectare, and the loss from diseases and insect pests was controlled below 4%. As the COVID-19 epidemic has been brought under effective control in China, Li Hongmei's wheat also entered the harvest time in May. She is full of joy when seeing the harvesters is busy working in the field. Confronted with the challenges brought by the COVID-19 pandemic situation to the monitoring and prevention of plant diseases and insect pests, 
We have covered 21 cities, 177 agricultural counties in the province through the one-to-one -one contact guidance system, produced 408 TV forecasts, and disseminated 340,000 pieces of information through the internet, TV, WeChat, SMS, and other digital means covering more than 30 million smallholder farmers in the province. Realizing remote guidance, successfully completing the wheat pest control tax, and lay a solid foundation for good harvest in the summer crops. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. I think uh, we could learn a lot from uh, these two distinctive uh, Chinese um, cases. And I can see that there is also uh, quite a lot of activity in the chat. So this is very good. So there are plenty of very, very insightful comments. Um, and I would like now to introduce the third presentation from Rashid. So I have already introduced uh, Rashid, the speaker. Uh, so let me just introduce the presentation which will be on the experience uh, in China, uh, using information and communication technologies, tools to support farmers with technical advice and marketing support during COVID-19 in an India. In India, sorry, not China, of course. Rashid, over to you. Maybe the sound is not good. In this presentation, I'm trying to share some of the experiences from India on using ICTs to address the problems faced by farmers during in marketing, as well as in terms of accessing extension and advisory services. Uh, India has a lo lot of India has a long history of using ICTs for agriculture, whether it is a uh, for traditional media or whether it is a modern uh, ICTs. Increasingly, call centers, voicemail, SMS, social media applications like Facebook and WhatsApp are increasingly used by extension and advisory services to share information and advice to farmers. But farmers still need a lot of personal engagement with extension extension personnel as well as market intermediaries. But the COVID-19 constrained these type of interactions and you all know the reasons for that because the markets are closed, transporters refuse to pick up the produce, there are a number of restrictions uh, in terms of movement of goods and advisory service personnel also couldn't go to the field because of they had to maintain the social distancing, social distancing and uh, public transport facilities were not available. And this resulted in a renewed interest in using ICTs to address some of this constraint. And during COVID-19, farmers were looking for advice related to one, especially marketing, where they wanted to know where to sell, how to sell the produce, what is the quantity demanded, and how do you transport, and, the, and what type of permissions are required. They need to get access to the kind of permissions from local officials, the collector, local administration, police, agriculture and LA departments, the transport department. And they also have an, they wanted to know about how to access inputs and services. The second major issue is they also wanted a problem solving advice related to crop management practices or maybe problems which are being faced at by the by the livestock. Initial response to these issues by the EAS has been on focusing mostly on, on health aspects. For example, advising farmers on how, not, how to reduce the chances of getting infected by COVID, maybe using masks, maintain social distancing, washing of hands. Then they soon started giving advice on, uh, on crop management, about harvesting produce procedures, and also in terms of how do you manage post-harvest operations, and which are the sectors that are relaxed, that have the government has relaxed some of the kind of guidelines in terms of the lockdown. But soon after, it became very clear that the marketing is going to, is the main issue that the farmers are facing. And a number of farmers and farmer organizations have been articulating it through social media and through the other types of media, television, national media. And the governments are basically forced to address this issue. 
I just wanted to talk about a few examples on how states have addressed this issue. One is the, the from the experience of Meghalaya, where the Department of Agriculture, through their 1917 teams, basically came forward and created new systems in place to help farmers and to connect them with the traders and other consumers. Mm -hmm. So they created a new agri response hotline, enhanced the number of vehicles under the under the 1917 team so that the produce could be picked up and transported to the places where there is a demand for it, create an interactive voice system. They make sure that the vehicles are able to, are, are monitored, the movement of vehicles are monitored, so the GPS, and there is a strong, very strong coordination role played by the government in establishing different types of teams. And this address to some extent, the kind of uh, losses which the farmers would have have been facing with if this kind of a mechanism would not have been here. Another example is from, is from Kerala. This is on the, the main uh, story is from the pineapple sector. March, April is a time where pineapple becomes ready for harvest and the Nagaland district in Kerala is one of the major hub of pineapple production and because the produce goes to many of the cities in the north. Uh, the prices have gone down because there, are, there is no buyer because of vehicles to transport these pineapples across the different states are not able to reach because of the lockdown. And the prices even went down to five rupees a kg. The farmers were, were staring at a very huge loss. And the Department of Agriculture made this kind of a program called the Pineapple Challenge, which was initiated, initiated by the Office Agricultural, Agricultural Officers Association. But then they created a mechanism to link farmers with the, with the consumers, especially the housing societies. They linked up with the Pineapple Farmers Association. They negotiated fixed up a price. And the government organizations again, created social media posters. They released press release. They organized press release, talked to, the press, talked to these people to promote this pineapple challenge, where they are offering to deliver pineapple at the gates the, at the it's the consumers at the rate of rupees 20 per kg. A lot of um, a number of a number of residents associations came forward to help in this, uh, this process. And because of this, the prices went up. And within 10 days, they could basically sell almost 50 tons of uh, pineapple. And the government mainstreamed this approach in other commodities. For example, now at every district, there are crisis management groups being created over, over WhatsApp, where the senior officers and the district officers, especially are, based, are together in a WhatsApp group, and the traders and the farmers are together, are being joined to a, a Facebook, to a, to a WhatsApp group, where the producers will be able to share what is the kind of a produce that are available for sale, and the traders will be able to access it. So I think this is what is happening. Another major example is coming from Maharashtra, where a number of farmer producer organizations are engaged are trying to help this entitled farmers in this crisis. And one example is the Abhinav Farmer Club, which has about 2 lakh farmer members. There are about 50, 50, 50, 56 small farmer clubs joined together into the kind of a bigger farm, Abhinav Farmer Club. So they have created an a, a app called Abhinav Farmer Park so that the consumers can place their order and make the online payments. And based on that order, farmers harvest the and they produce, pack it, and make it, make it, and make they make it deliver at the residential societies. Yep, beyond marketing, ICTs are also used increasingly to provide advisory support to farmers through WhatsApp groups, through Facebook live video, live videos, and uh, YouTube channels, oh, YouTube yeah. live channels, WhatsApp, Telegram groups, and there's a mechanism to to to, to trace the kind of what is the the, the comments, shares, views during and after this event. So I think this is another way in which many of these organizations have started putting more and more these videos and uh, discussions over the Facebook and or, the, or many other social uh, media. And uh, finally, I would like to say that because many other organizations like the network of extension providers are also you are using these social media, especially to raise awareness on the problems farmers are facing and share potential solutions and farmer experiences. 
especially field level experiences on how are we are addressing this kind of thing. And I, mean, I think we may be having problem with the uh, blogs and field notes. But to conclude, I would like to say that now ICTs do play a major important role in addressing the issue of uh, from COVID-19. But it has worked very well in places where there are existing groups of farmers. There are existing there are farmer groups are present or and also where there's a strong coordination mechanisms are being played and or exist or it has been developed in response to this COVID-19. So in other words, it is not that ICTs alone are basically making a kind of a difference, but ICTs when applied together with the with social capital and strong coordination makes a lot of makes a lot of difference. And thank you very much. Okay. Thank you a lot, uh, Rashid. Um, we are now passing to our country case from Laos, uh, which will be um, presented by you, Mr. Salantau Knamvong, who is deputy head for the Division of Agriculture, Information and National. Um, Sorry, a national project director for Lao Upland Rural Advisory Services, Department of Technical Extension and Agro-Processing at the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry. The presentation uh, is what um, could COVID-19 crisis be uh, a turning point for youth in agriculture and what are the implications for rural advisory services in Lao People's Democratic Republic? Um, Mr. Savanton Navong uh, will introduce himself. Okay, over to you. Thank you. Hello and good morning, everyone. Today I'm very happy Hello. and exciting to join the webinar extension and advisory service at the front line of COVID-19, less for ensuring food security in Asia. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Suvan Tong Nambo. I'm connected to the Department of Technical Extension and Agro Processing, Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, Vientiane Lao PR. Currently, I am a National Project uh, Director for Lao Upland Rural Advisory Service. I serve for agriculture extension and rural development more than 16 years with expertise on training, organizational development, and capacity building for women and private sector engagement. Experience in project design and management I am a secretary to National Working Group on Farmer and Agri-Net and also listener network of extension agency like Mekong Extension Learning Alliance or MELA. Today, I will talk about my topic on could the COVID-19 crisis be a turning point for use in agriculture and what are the implications for rural advisory service? So in my first slide, I will highlight it on e billeting Because before of the COVID-19 in Laos, uh, the people, they are not familiar with digitalization. But nowadays, uh, many organizations, they using different social media to organize teleconference, including my ministry, and also the teacher, they have to improve their knowledge and skill to uh, take the online course. And many people, they stay at the home, they need to order their food to different type of the app and uh, hotline numbers. So in this, my presentation, we will uh, focus on who will be the making pre-step use of the digital technology in agriculture. In this slide and next slide, I will talk about what happening in the past in Laos. 
in the past two decades, blue law youth have been living home in large number. They have taken up insecure jobs in cities or become mechanic workers in neighboring countries. These workers have been severely impacted by the COVID, by the economic consequences of COVID-19. As a consequence of the pandemic, people have returned to rural towns and villages in large number. According to UN study in 2017, estimate that 1.3 million of Laos citizens live outside of the countries and about 70% of the population. This is quite a big number. So, and uh, what we know, number two, uh, young people and migrant workers are far more likely than on the farmers to own smartphone, have social media accounts, and are familiar with various other apps. They were exposed to this technology outside of their home environment and are bringing this technology back to the village. For example, 85% of Facebook users in Laos are under 35 years. So more detailed difference between the uh, male and female account Facebook you can see in this picture. So from the past experience, now I would like to share some example from Laos. During the COVID-19 uh, lockdown, we use different types of social media, just as this young lady farmer using YouTube inform the policy makers on her program of selling their product. Online discussion among extensionist developer and expertise to Google Group that over 4,000 members. Technical training to lie and whatever. Young farmers, agribusiness and their clients communicating using whatever. In addition, Farmer-to-farmer farmer learning is a key element of our cleanness extension approach and this also be done online as well. From program to opportunity, in this section I would like to inform the audience that now we have an opportunity in doing new innovation in agricultural production and marketing because many thousands of young people are back in their original place like rural areas where their parents don't have ability like them especially the skill on searching information searching marketing price and stay connected with the wider social network and organization to the smartphone so what do you think? This be an opportunity for the generation of rural community. In this slide, I will talk about what we are learning. We see farming as a business because right now many young people in Laos are interested to working in agricultural sector and they want to be an entrepreneur due to young farmer interest more for digitalization in agriculture in agribusiness. Our loans as an extension service is no longer to disseminate recommended practices, but we do need to do more on facilitation, interaction among and between on stakeholders, and how to make better use of existing platform. In parallel with opportunity in slide number six, we also have many challenges on how to support the need of the new normal, why we still have the capacity of the old normal. 
give us identify the challenges to making fit test use of social media in a study carried out in 2015. As concluded that true agricultural organizations are slowly adopting to the changing scenarios. Faster action are required to better utilize social media. With the arrival of COVID-19, the scenario has changed even faster. So can last cat up or will get left behind. In this slide, I would like to share with you about our response. In Laos, we use existing capacity to immediately improve opportunity for rural use later than waiting for yet another restructuring of the extension service. A single institution cannot do this alone, but we must bring together the public and private sector, mass organization, and farmer networks. We implement a new scheme called AGRI, mean agripreneurs for cleaners, rural enterprise, and employment. In response to COVID-19, we want to expand the scheme and add another E. So I agree, agripreneurs for cleaners, rural enterprise, empowerment, and E empowerment. It is the end of my presentation, and thank you very much for your kind attention and feedback. Thank you, Kop Chaylera. Okay, thank you so much. I think uh, there are all very interesting um, experiences from uh, Asia. Now we would like to pass to the question and answers. As I said before, we have already quite a lot of activity, both in the Q&A and in the uh, chat box. Um, the Q&A will be facilitated by our, our two other colleagues from Research and Extension Unit at FAO, Ms. Aleksandrova Stefanova, who has a long-term experience in different, uh, she's an agriculture extension officer in uh, our unit. She has a long-term experience in different areas of agricultural innovation, such as biotechnologies and biosafety, digital innovation, um, in the context of agriculture innovation systems. And she works on policy advice and approaches to increase access to demand-driven knowledge, research, and services to smallholder farmers, men and women. And she supports countries in transforming their agriculture extension systems and bridging institutions to bring, facilitate and upscale innovations for enhanced livelihoods of rural communities. And um, Dr. Uh, Yang Puyun, uh, who is also agriculture extension officer in our, and training in our uh, unit, he has over 25 years of uh, career as an extension plant protection specialist on developing and implementing crop pest management policies and programs. He recently joined FAO and is working as, ag mm, yes, as agricultural training and extension officers, uh, officer in Rome. And he works on farmer education and training program development, training capacity build up, institutionalization of goods training and extension practices, facilitation of agriculture extension and advisory service innovation. Okay, so. Over to you, colleagues. Thank you very much, um, 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 Sophia. Um, the way we are going to proceed now, based on the very rich discussion, uh, both in the chat and the Q&A um, box during the whole presentations, will be uh, the following. I will uh, ask uh, one to two questions to um, each of our uh, speakers and they will have um, about one minute to respond to those questions and then I will pass the floor to uh, Yang to summarize um, the responses on the question that we asked you in the middle of the presentations actually about uh, what the extension services should uh, stop doing, start doing, or uh, keep doing and doing more. Uh, without further ado, Mr. Uh, Dharmapuri, there was a very interesting study that you showed. Um, there were quite some discussions about it. Um, people would like to know more, especially on the food price increases that uh, often measures 
uh, the impact of COVID-19. Um, the question to you is very short. Are the studies available online and where people, when, and where and when people can have access to it? Uh, ongoing. What we have put on the, what we have, uh, the key messages that we have taken up so far. Initial assessments or rapid assessments have been completed. So we are finalizing those reports as and when they're completed, they will all be start getting posted online after few clearances. Um, and so, and then we will move on to the next. Impact on food and agriculture, because so then that will be more uh, sort of a deep dive into the sector. Thank you very much. My next question goes to Deggy. Uh, Deggy, your presentation generated a lot of discussions about um, what are the innovations in agriculture in, um, extension and advisory services uh, system. And uh, there were a lot of discussions about the approaches, the technical innovations, but there are there other innovations that are not technical? And could you elaborate a little bit more on this? Good question, Levena. Thank you. Uh, and yes, there is uh, plenty of uh, very stimulating discussion in the chat room, and uh, which kind of answers many questions that's being raised in the, in the question Q&A box as well. And yes, uh, so the innovations, we are not only about technologies. No, technologies are, means that's used in processes that's really innovative. And I team, for example, is really creative way of linking farmers with uh, with market and also in India, there is a women self-help groups, which is really creative way of organizing uh, women farmers and having them access and facilitate the marketing of the perishable uh, produce. And uh, as well as um, also uh, group learning and in, uh, in, uh, in uh, isolation through using um, the you know social media or WhatsApp groups uh, etc. So there is lots of uh, different ways of organizing producers and also in Italy where we are I am there is a lot of interesting ways of producers are you are we suddenly um, uh, you are just taking orders through regular phone and uh, organizing themselves to deliver uh, to the door and so those are the kind of you know um, innovations that's happening and there are many more uh, which uh, which is also uh, people mentioned in the chat box and uh, shared their links to their studies. Thank you, thank you, Deggy. Uh, my next question goes to Ms. Nan Bay, the Director of the Department of Public Affairs, Pinduoduo e-commerce platform. Uh, your presentation generated a lot of uh, interest, in particular, uh, how to start and facilitate an e-commerce pl platform, as they are very um, timely and actual these days. Um, so if you have one, uh, key advice to give when you start um, the e-commerce platform, please do so in one sentence. And then there was a specific question. Um, did you face any um, food uh, safety issue uh, during the um, e-commerce uh, implementations? Over to you, Ms. Bay. Uh, hi, Navena. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, however, I cannot answer your question here because our uh, company policy, but I can do, um, you know, reply uh, to your email about your question uh, through email and uh, um, we can keep in touch through email and uh, discuss there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, thank you very much. It's understood. Then we probably can uh, summarize different experiences on e-commerce and um, 
consolidate lessons learned further on. Thank you very Thank much. Thank Sorry, you. just wanted to say that I'm also uh, typing into the chat uh, Ms. Nambay's email. So uh, everyone can find it there. Very good. Thank you. So my next question goes to Mrs. Zhang Mei um, in the Plant Protection Station of Sichuan Provincial Department. Your presentation was very uh, impressive in terms of how you could uh, manage totally remotely uh, to um, prevent and mitigate um, a pest uh, disease coming. And uh, the question to you is, how many extension agents were serving the Santai County to be able to cover uh, half a million of farmers? Over to you. Uh, Miss May, can you hear me? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, and we, we have covered 20, 21 cities uh, and 177 agriculture uh, districts and counties in the province. And the, uh, in the Santai County, uh, we have um, more, uh, more than, more than, um, we have more than 100 uh, technicians to do this work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, then Rashid, um, digital innovations in uh, in the chat and in the Q&A um, um, box. Um, so the, there was a concern that digital innovations require investment and infrastructure while farmers need uh, this information just right now and this is especially in the time of crisis like the COVID-19. But what is the role of the capacity development and value addition uh, with respect to um, uh, digital extension in your view? As I said before, there is a lot of uh, ICTs have been used by extension advisory services. The only thing is that it now got a, a much bigger impetus because it basically cut off you know, people who have been otherwise interacting, pers interacting personally. But what we have been seeing is that it is not the ICT per se that is important. ICT is in the hands of EAS, especially if, if their capacities to use ICTs are enhanced, they can do a lot more than merely sharing information because traditionally we have been sending a lot of information down pushing information but now we are using it to solve problems and also link farmers to marketing so we are seeing much higher or more efficient use of icts but this needs a lot of building a lot of capacities of extension and advisory services and we have and i hope after this when we are getting a lot of more experience on how to use these I see this in a time, in a crisis like this, we should be able to do more. But then capacity development is the, is the, I would say that the most important point, capacity development of advisory services in using digital tools. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Namvo, um, my question is now to you. The reverse migration um, of young people, both to rural areas, you said posed both challenges and opportunities. Uh, how the rural advisory services in Laos shall change in order to be able to respond to and grasp the opportunities? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, question. Uh, this uh, is the big challenge for us uh, because uh, uh, it's related to the attitudes and also uh, related to uh, the extension itself. 
because uh, in Laos we uh, have uh, many uh, uh, project, many program on uh, rural advisory service, but uh, we still limiting on how communicate in terms of supporting uh, smallholder farmers. Like the project that I'm working for, we uh, have some scheme as I mentioned in my presentation. And nowadays I, I saw a lot of uh, young people that uh, they lost a job from uh, neighboring countries as well as uh, inside, uh, inside Laos. They uh, moved back to their hometown in rural area. So it is for uh, Lao extension uh, needs have to think how to uh, keep the opportunity of the young people who have a skillful on using uh, mobile phone or different uh, ICT to help them uh, thinking how to uh, improve uh, agriculture production in Laos. Thank you very much. So I hear from you that the extension services should uh, go youthful. And with this, I would like to pass the floor to my colleague Yang uh, to highlight further the, the answers to your answers to the questions. Okay. And you. Thank you so much, Novena, and thanks so much to all the speakers. I would just like to highlight that we are a little bit behind the time. So I would like um, Yang to ask you if you can kind of try to summarize um, as much as possible so we don't keep than people to too long in the room. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Nevala and uh, Sophia. First of all, I would, like, I would like to thank all the participants because they have you know, submitted so many you know, responses to the questions. I try to you know, do my best to summarize you know, as short as possible. And first, uh, I would like to share with you the three key points, three key points. The first one we noticed from the response of the participants in combating COVID-19, we need a promotion the innovations on extension and service system, and which including organizational, institutional, managerial, financial approach and working mode changes and innovations. The second key point we figured out, you know, the major change you know, should made in the right directions. For example, the extension of the waste service, we should change it from food crop focused, maybe to both cash crop and food crop inclusive, from production focused to the whole value chains, as many of the participants mentioned about, including the whole value chains, from public sectors to private sectors, from the supply drive to the demand, the demand drive. The last point, the key point is we learned from the participants, the two aspects of is, is, is taking an advice service, you know, and need to be enhanced, two aspects need to be enhanced. The first one is the enhancing the facilitation of interaction among the different stakeholders. For example, from farmer to farmer, from extension agents to farmers, from private sector to the public sectors, the second one is the need to enhance the linkage between the research, extension, and the farmers. And then at last, I, I would like to go to the answers of the, from the answers and the responses from the three questions from the participants. The first question is, uh, go to what should the EAS start doing from now on? That for farmers' health education and combating COVID-19, such as curriculum development for family school, for farm night school, for farm morning school, farm business school, all these you know, training your tools and should they you know, include the curriculum of the health, farm health education. The second one is uh, conducting you know, rapid assessment of the challenges of COVID-19 on food security, agriculture, and feedback the farmers' needs to the government and the renewable sectors. The, so the second you know, question, what should our extension and the advisory service specialists stop doing? The first uh, should you know, stop the organization of the physical training or meetings in large scales, 
during the pandemic period. Second one, as some of the participants mentioned about stopping the dissemination of the fake news. The third one is, uh, as some people you know, mentioned about, we should uh, stop exactly exaggerate the inequality between the women and the men to the in the pandemic of the fighting. The last question about the, what should the EAS continue to do and do more? The first is to go to the digital and beyond as many other countries are mentioned about from the Europe, from the Asia, from the African countries mentioned about go digital and beyond using the you know, SMES, WeChat, and WhatsApp online and all this kind of online platforms, you know, including the social medias. The second point is about promoting the measures to ensure to ensure the increasing the farmers' incomes, that that including the in, in, have farmers to access to the social protection and insurance, have farmers to the find the new opportunities for the increasing of the incomes for senior farmers to increase and improve. And the third point is strengthen the. Uh, inf infrastructure, institution setups, and the financial mechanism. This is for the long term, or for the you know, for the recovery from the COVID nineteen you know, pandemic. The last point is to ensure preparing funding of the extension and the advice service. So the, the last point is about the, the property you know, funding mechanism should be set up for the extension and the advice service. So I hope I can you know summarize the property for the you know response for the all the participants okay thank you very much uh, back to sophia thank you sophia okay thank you so much yang and thank uh, thanks so much also to all the participants for the very uh, you know active uh, discussion in the chat and in the q and a uh, we are a little bit behind the time, so I would like uh, now to give the floor to Selvaraja for his closing remarks. But just in the meantime, we would also like to ask you for whoever is interested, so this is absolutely not um, nothing mandatory, but we would have a great pleasure if you could um, stay a little bit longer and elaborate in the chat of uh, some particular experiences that you may have come across in your countries or in your organizations regarding EIS response to the COVID-19. So you can also uh, leave your email. Uh, so maybe we can then contact you for uh, perhaps for some details. So whoever thinks that there is something interesting to, to share, please go ahead and type your, uh, describe your um, experience in the chat. And on this note, I would like to give the floor uh, to Selvarajan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia and colleagues. Uh, it is a rich discussion and uh, lots of information to digest. Uh, just I would like to highlight some key messages from this webinar. Uh, coming to the impacts of COVID-19 on food and agriculture sector, there are a number of impacts were highlighted. Some of them are movement restrictions that affect food supply chains, poor or no access to agricultural inputs and markets, declining income and job losses, vulnerability of some countries are higher due to compounding factors such as extreme climate events such as cyclones, incidence of crop pests and diseases, and heavy dependence on imports. Extension and advisory services have a role to play to reduce these impacts. That was of course obviously that was highlighted by almost all the speakers. EAS is a network of actors, which includes public, private, non-governmental, farmers organizations, and civil society organizations, etc. EAS can support in the near and medium term perspective, emergency support and expanding social protection, engage to address supply chain related issues, promote local food production and connect to markets, technical advice to maintain livelihoods, raise awareness and ensure access to inputs, markets, and credits. But EAS-related services should be adopted to address the major crisis like, like COVID-19. 
This would ensure to provide simple messages in local languages, develop new skill sets to support production during the crisis, use digital tools is important, but access to digital services need to be improved. E-commerce platforms can help farm smallholders mitigate agriculture damage uh, because of COVID-19. Use of social media such as Facebook, YouTube videos, especially to uh, address the issues in high value crops like tea, it was also highlighted in the chat box. Help to connect during the lockdown. These uh, tools in the social media can help to connect to the, uh, connect to the farmers during this lockdown. Use remote monitoring equipment for monitoring of crop pests and diseases. Control was also highlighted from China. Farmer to farmer learning through online tools was also uh, stressed from Laopedia. In the longer term perspective, there was a strong message that uh, uh, highlights that there should be a structural transformation and reform of extension and advisory services, taking into consideration of current and emerging challenges. And the agricultural extension and advisory services should address more boldly the problems in the entire value chain, not only focusing on just production. EAS should go digital with necessary capacity building, as well as infrastructure enhancement. With this concluding summary, I thank all the participants and presenters of this webinar for, act, for your active participation. Our next webinar on the same topic will focus on Eastern Europe and Central Asia in the coming weeks. I thank for your kind attention. Over to you, Sophia. Okay, many thanks, Salvarajo, for the closing uh, remarks. And um, I think this is uh, the end of our webinar. I think it was an extremely interesting and enlightening discussion. I was trying to follow the chat to the extent possible. Uh, so once again, um, on my side, big, big thanks for everyone to connect, for the participants, for our speakers, um, and also to our technical team, uh, Monia, Charlotte, and Julia, without whom this webinar could have not happened. So big thanks to everyone, and uh, thank you for your participation, and have a very, very nice reminder of the day. We will be sending the presentations and the recording of the webinar soon to all the registered uh, participants, and also information about our upcoming uh, webinar uh, on Europe and Central Asia mentioned by Selvarajo. Thank you so much. Bye.